Since the day I launched this YouTube channel, I've been looking into other martial arts besides Shotokan Karate, such as this, this, and this. If you'd like to watch these videos, please watch it from the link up above. Today we're going to be diving deeper into the martial art of American Kenpo with the help of Daniel from Auto One Dojo. It's a super high quality martial art YouTube channel, so please check it out from the description box as well. And let's get started with today's video. So thank you for being on the channel today. Um, today I'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, Kenpo because um, I've done a reaction video before and I'm not sure if I understood your art uh, deep enough. So if I can ask you some questions today to understand Kenpo together and with the audience, Shotokan audience as well, um, I really appreciate it. So first, cool. um, for those of you that don't know um, who you are, could you briefly explain about yourself and your martial art um, experience as well? Well, my name is Daniel. Um, my martial arts experience is primarily in um, Ed Parker's American Kenpo, and I've had a few different versions of that. But um, I started in 1993 when I was 14 years old uh, here in America, South Florida. And um, I didn't know what karate was. I had wanted to train karate mm -hmm. for several years. I told my parents I wanted to do karate. And um, we moved from New York down to Florida. And oh. just one day they came out to me with a newspaper clip and they're saying, hey, look, here's a karate class. You want to try it out? And I went, sure, OK. And yeah, I just I just stuck with it and I went with it. And then the more I learned, you know, we started sparring and all that. And I just fell in love with it more and more and more and realized mm -hmm. I want to keep going with this. And my experience at this point, I'm about 28 years now experience with Kempo, wow. um, but, but multiple different versions because we went through a lot of different school changes. Um, mm. My first instructor taught what was called the Tracy Kempo. It's an offshoot of Ed Parker Kempo. I see. And then a few years later, uh, actually right before we were going to test for black belt, he switched over to Ed Parker traditional Kempo. So we kind of had to go back to white belt and start all over again. So, which right, I didn't mind yeah. because I actually, I liked the new material. Mm -hmm. And we did that for a few years, but at that point he was uh, training under Jeff Speakman. If you don't know, know if you're familiar with who Jeff Speakman is, um, Jeff Speakman was one of Ed Parker's last students and he had just had um, a movie come out called The Perfect Weapon and he had tweaked his own version of Kempo. So we did that for I a little see, bit. And then Jeff Speakman came out with a whole new version of Kempo called Kempo 5.0. And I think that's was, the one I saw on the reaction yes. video. Mm, for the sparring, mm. yes, Kempo 5.0. Yes, and yes. Kempo 5.0 was fantastic. And oh. uh, basically, just the real nutshell, what that is, is you know, there, uh, Ed Parker had three different manuals, like three different versions of his curriculum. Uh, that's American Kempo. And then and Jeff Speakman had 4.0, which was he tweaked it. 5.0 was his big revolution. He added in um, a lot of grappling, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm. He tried to modified a lot of the entries and techniques and he just did a lot right. of tweaks for it and it's still changing every day so mm. we did that and then after a few years my instructor broke away from Jeff Speakman and we just became our own school but he started training MMA fighters so we just started blending a little bit of Muay Thai techniques a little bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu into our Kempo curriculum I got to spar the MMA guys very very tough so I got to experience that and then he moved away in 2015. I continue training on my own. And right now my experience is I'm trying to find arts that complement Kempo. So mm -hmm. I've been exploring them. Mm -hmm. um, for three years, I've been training with a Japanese Jiu Jitsu school that also teaches Judo. So I fell in love with that. I'm doing a lot more grappling and stand-up stuff I didn't have with Kempo. And I'm just finding a lot of parallels <laughs> and mixtures. And it's just, it's, all, it's done nothing but grow my love for the martial arts. Right. That's so much variety of martial arts compared to a normal Japanese martial artist um, in Japan. So it's very interesting to see that that open mindedness of you doing a lot of different martial arts. And I think it's very close to the, the characteristic of Kenpo Karate, right? How it changes and how it keeps on evolving. So yes. I, I'll I like to talk a little bit about that later um, in this video as well. And what I find interesting or what I find um, as a general question uh, from a Japanese um, karate uh, karateka or karate practitioner is do Kempo practitioners um, consider Kempo as a karate style or is it just Kempo? That's my question. I'm still trying to answer this to be honest with you because mm. the answer is both yes and no. Like one, there's a lot of different versions of Kempo. There's there's right, Okinawan right. Kempo, there's Chinese Kempo, Shrinji Kempo. It's it, there's so many different branches, mm -hmm. and American Kempo is 
I feel American. an offshoot of oh. that, but it, it's mm. it's a hybrid. So in a way, we're not Kempo. Like we have a very heavy Chinese martial arts background, mm. but mm. it's also very dependent on Japanese karate as well. Like our basics, like our strikes and a lot of our stances, while it's a little bit different, our basics, our kihon is very, very, very similar to karate. Mm. But a lot of our movements and forms are more Chinese oriented. Mm. So you will see schools that will call it karate some people will just call it kempo some schools call it chinese karate um oh. ed parker himself he wrote this book back in 1960 i believe he just called it kempo karate at the beginning kempo karate. so and there was also um i think he had there back in like in the 50s and 60s when he was teaching it in america the word karate wasn't as well known and there's actually a funny story that he wrote in his first book that um, when he was opening up his first school, he put a big, you know, karate sign and his neighbor, the next door came over and goes, karate, what is that? Some sort of a Mexican food? And he goes, no, it's, it's, it's a system of self-defense. And the guy's like, all right, good luck. You'll be out of business in a year. Mm. Well, so a lot of terms get interchanged with like even sometimes it was called karate jujitsu is trying to build the familiarity because Kempo was not a name that Americans knew. Mm. but to consider yes. do we consider it a style of karate I'm, i would say for the most part yes there's mm. there's differences but there's also a lot of overlap so there's definitely karate embedded in it for sure so i, I guess you know there are uh, kempo karate or american kempo karate is a mixture of uh, different things so i guess the the the, the, the term itself isn't so important i guess right it, whether if it's kempo well, karate the- or jujitsu karate or no, but what's interesting though, the terms more denote the time period it was because Ed Parker's ah. system went through different changes. <laughs> I um, see. I mean, yeah. It's interesting. His the name is, itself changes. Like it name it's, itself it's something changes. we can't yeah. think of in Japan. So yeah. the rule with Kempo, American Kempo, is it never stays the same. <laughs> mm, right, 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 right. That's but funny, that's funny. yeah, because I mean, um, Ed Parker was a student of. Uh, William K.S. Chow in Hawaii, mm, who was mm. a student of James Matosi. And there's a lot of politics that go with this. I try to steer away from that because mm. there's a lot of people who are like, there's a lot of people who like to troll and cause trouble. But the general history is Ed Parker <laughs> learned these different styles. And when he was working with um, William Chow in Hawaii, they were talking about how a lot of the older arts were great, but they didn't necessarily translate to American street fighting, that there was mm. a lot of new street fighting mm. methods on the street. and. Ed Parker grew up in Honolulu in a rough area, so he found himself uh, in a lot of fights growing up. So he talked to William Chow about about crafting a new version of Kempo that was more practical for street fighting and a little bit less on the traditional aspects of it to mm-hmm. adapt. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a lot of debates as to how this went down, whether Ed Parker had permission or not, or whether there, there's a, again a lot of he said, she said mm-hmm. with this, but mm-hmm. ultimately. Ed Parker came to the United States and started teaching um, his version of Kempo. And what's interesting is, um, like you'll see in this book, his early version of Kempo was, um, it looked a lot like traditional karate. I don't, I don't know if you can see this, but I can send oh, you yeah, some yeah. pictures of it. But um, it, it promotes the use of the makawara and a lot of the, the same oh. strength building techniques. And it definitely looks like traditional karate. And as he went on, he started blending more influences. He started putting boxing mm-hmm. elements into it. He was a boxer. He was also um, an accomplished judoka. So he started implementing mm-hmm. judo tactics into it. There was Chinese martial arts and kung fu mix into it. So he kept tinkering with it. And um, one of the differences was at this time, like in the 50s and 60s, like traditional karate, a lot of the self-defense were like one step, two step. There were basic quick right, sequences. Right, right. And then when it got to be about the 60s, he wanted to he wanted to revamp the whole system. Mm. And this was kind of where one of the bigger breakoffs happened. Um, he had two students, um, Alan Jim Tracy. They were training underneath him. Well, they didn't want to go in this new direction. They wanted to continue oh. with what he was doing. So they went this way. He went this way. And they kind of had a common ancestor. But Ed Parker continued to revamp his system. They started to build on what they were already learning. So. They're mm. very similar, but there's some little bit differences. I see, but I see. Ed Parker just constantly changed. I mean, he just he always felt that the system had to grow and adapt to the modern day fighting requirements. It's it's so interesting to hear the the differences in how martial arts evolute in mm-hmm. different countries. Because in Japan, it's um, there's a beauty of 
preserving something or to continue something. So things、mm-hmm. like that, I think, would not you know come across a Japanese mind. But in the states, it's always you know it's just natural to compare and to take in what's good、mm-hmm. for them. So just the mindset difference. <laughs> Just, it's it's huge and it's it's very interesting to see that happen. Also, I provide private and group lessons online, so if you'd like to check that out, please check it out from this link up above. The first week for the group lesson is free, so why don't you give it a try? Let's continue with the video.、Uh, my next question is、um, the key characteristics. What are the key characteristics of Kempo?、Uh, or I mean, I I know it's a mixture of、um, different martial arts, but compared to other、uh, martial arts, what are the the key characteristics that differentiate? Itself from others. For let's say for Shotokan or for Karate, I think、uh, Hikite or、um, the way we move the legs, like like、um, relaxing of the front knee,、um, how we do Oizukis, those are very um, a clear um, um, characteristic of Shotokan or Karate in general. Or there is something like that in Kempo? There's definitely characteristics.、Um, our stances tend to be a little bit different. I mean, they're.、Mm. You can see that they're based on a lot of the karate stances, but they're、um, they're not as deep.、Mm. And、um, I believe, like our front stance,、um, it's not as deep as a traditional karate stance would be. And also, we tend to bend the front knee a little bit more and kind of almost bring the knee over our center line a little bit.、Oh. That we 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 have a, we have a heavy emphasis on keeping that center line away. So if we're in a fighting stance, which typically is more of like similar to a boxing stance, we want to you know we don't want to face it like this. We want to be more on a forty five degree angle so that our center line、mm-hmm. is limited.、Mm-hmm. And some of the concepts are we always have this dynamic with our hands. If one hand is high, the other hand has to be mid level, and our legs protect our、oh. lower body. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna、um, strike with this hand, I don't want to leave my face open. I'm gonna bring this hand up as a check. Or if I'm going to strike low, this hand has to be high. So we、I、always have this like this this pattern going. So if we're going to do like a whole sequence, one hand is always moving to cover、uh, the other hand. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting.、Mm-hmm. Are there any? And I th- um. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, and, and I think again,、uh, some of the more defining factors is the way we approach the self defense in these longer sequences that most arts don't seem to do it that way. Mm, 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 mm. I think and, in karate,、um, the longest one would be like five. Five sequences、yeah. at once, so I do understand. That would be, that. yeah, that would be about a mid-level technique. There's techniques that've got six, seven, eight, and as you get into like,、um, when you hit black belt, you go into your upper dan levels. You go back and you learn extensions. So it's kind of like, well, for whatever reason, if that didn't work, here's like five more steps to it.、Oh. So it, I can see where people are like, you know, you're never going to pull off twenty moves. No,、mm-hmm. but we're not meant to take this technique and put it to the street. Those twenty moves are teaching something. So each technique has. Several ideas in it, so that maybe we only need one or two of those moves.、Mm. Or, as Ed Park would say, is he goes, "We're not trying to make you robots. You might take move number one of technique five and blend it with move number seven of technique twenty. You never know what's going to mix and match. It's kind of like a big、uh, Lego building block set. You can just once you learn how the pieces fit, you can build what you need to at that time." I see. I see. I see. Are there、um, any sparring、um, techniques that are distinct、um, to Kempo, such、um, in Karate, the one that's right now broadcasting in the Olympics,、um, movements such as the、um, it's called gyakujo in Japanese, where you don't step and punch with the back backhand at the same time. It's more of you relaxing the front knee and lunging forward for that reverse、mm-hmm. punch. That's something.、Uh, it's a、uh, application of oizuki, a following punch in、uh, karate. Are there anything like that?、Um, maybe that's something you see in MMA or、um, relating to like something like that. There are definite、um, distinct things that we have in Kempo sparring. So this is where it gets weird because a lot of schools、mm. will treat this differently.、Um, mm-hmm. One of the common complaints is people are like, "Oh, you do these techniques, but when Kempo goes into sparring, it looks like any other martial art," which、oh. is true to a point, unless you kind of know what to look for.、Um, Kempo does have specific freestyle sparring techniques. Oh, Unfortunately, they've been kind of lost. A lot of schools dropped them in the eighties, nineties, and、mm. I find that very unfortunate because there's there's a wealth of knowledge. And the concept is, Ed Parker taught us there's these basic moves, 
And then we have our self-defense techniques that are these long, complicated sequences. He wanted a set of curriculum that was kind of in, in the middle to bridge that. So that way right. you could take the concepts that you learned in your self-defense techniques mm -hmm. and apply them in a sparring match. So mm -hmm. he had a whole system of what were called freestyle techniques. And just just, just give you like, like the white belt level, for example, we have a technique called B1A. And each number and letter stands for something. It's like a combination. Mm -hmm. So... B stands for the base move, and the base move would be, you know, you're going to reach, grab their front hand and pull them down diagonally, and what that does is it cancels their height and their width, and then you follow up with a punch. Now, that, wow. that, that switching in place would be number one. So B is the base move. Number one is very, the in-place switch. Very systematic. Very efficient. Yeah, very, very systematic. <laughs> the way yeah. they need the... <laughs> wow. Exactly. And then A mm. would be for the head, B would be for the body. And it builds on that. Then you've got KB1A, which adds kicks. And then you've got foot maneuvers. And it, <laughs> it looks really complicated. It sounds complicated. But you learned them, you know, little bits at a time through a bell. Mm. And I guess a lot of schools felt it was extraneous. And a lot of schools stopped teaching it, mm. like mine included. So I've actually made it a point to go back and try to learn some of the stuff and implement it in sparring now. And I'm finding a lot of it still works. It's it's They're good for advancing offensive attacks. And it's like a blitz sequence. And then you can find yourself in you know you can find yourself in positions that you recognize oh now I can do this part of a technique now I can do this takedown once you've made that contact so mm. there there is a definite distinct style of Kempo sparring that unfortunately is kind of becoming lost see, it's, it's just see. not that's, around anymore and so I wish it was because mm. you, know. you know that's I think that's a very um, the, the I guess what Kempo is right now in, in today's um, world is the result of you know, I guess, I guess different mindsets, right, of the Japanese and the American people. You know, since <clears throat> their ch change is a common thing for Kempo, I think it's meant to be, um, it's meant to go closer to, let's say, MMA or other, I guess, other martial arts because it becomes the, an average of other martial arts that that they take in, mm -hmm. and I I think one of the reasons why people um. I, I, you mentioned that history videos um, or something that everybody's looking for is because since there has been so much change, people are always looking for that origin. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear from that perspective. In, in Japan, people aren't so, like regarding martial arts, like so interested in, in the history. They rather focus on the what's in front of them right now, like skill-wise and mental-wise. And I think one of the reasons is because there hasn't been a, a large change there have been minor changes adjustments but it's not like a huge breakthrough kind of change so that was a very interesting um, topic to hear um, how do Kempo practitioners American Kempo practitioners um, see Japanese karate practitioners do they even care or like what are their ideas behind it um, I would definitely say there's a mix um, I can't speak for everyone of course just what right, I've right. encountered myself but um, I've noticed like I, a lot of the guys I train with Many of them started in Shotokan or Goju Ryu, oh. and there are there are already a lot of them are already coming from the Japanese background. Oh wow! And I, I want to say that for the most part, Kempo looks at Japanese karate as almost like um, a family member, like it's a sister art or brother art. Oh. That you know something like Shotokan is so foundational, and it's got such deep roots, and it's become the base of so much that a lot of the concepts be, they 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 transcend they, they become part of mm. other arts. Like we have. Yeah, we're Kempo's Chinese in nature for the most part, but there's a, still a lot of karate techniques in it, a lot of mm -hmm. ideas. We still wear the dogi. We still do a lot of the same rituals. We have the same basics. So I I personally believe, and from what I see and feel, is that we look at Japanese martial arts as almost like a like a sensei. They're, they're before us. They're our elder. Mm -hmm. They were our beginning, or they're at least a foundation. And without them, we wouldn't have what we have now. What, what was the other, other half? Like, you, you mentioned there are two sides, so I was wondering if there's a... The other half, know. I'd say, would be people who, same type of people who'd be critical of, of martial arts in general. Oh. They might look at, these would be people who like, oh, I don't like the traditional stuff as much because it's, I don't like point sparring or I don't like the sport oh. aspect of it. And it's, it's a lot of the stuff you see on YouTube. A lot of people complaining <laughs> that not everyone has the appreciation. I see. I see. Um, <laughs> fortunately, the people I train with do. So I try to, I try uh. to surround myself by people who have that respect and appreciation. Mm, I mm, do think mm. it's connected you know it's they are related they're brother sister father son however you want to mm -hmm. compare it to but um i think there's a lot of respect that needs to be shown to the japanese arts because 
they kind of paved the way from to where we are. <laughs> I see, I see. So my last question is,、um, what do you think、um, attracts people to American Kenpo Karate? What are the main reasons a lot of people start、uh, American Kenpo Karate? A couple reasons.、Um, I'm going to be 100% honest. I think a lot of Kenpo's attracts people because it looks flashy. It looks It looks cool. Like we have this tradition of doing what's called technique lines. So when we when we、mm-hmm. practice a bunch of these sequences, we line up in class or at a demonstration at a fair or whatever, and we'll have a whole line of attackers, and the first person in front will do this flashy technique. We make solid contact, so we hit hard, and it looks great. And people look at them like, "Oh, that's cool. I, I want to learn that."、Mm-hmm. Then we also have、um, Ed Parker himself. <coughs> Sorry. No problem. We also have Ed Parker himself and. Regardless of how anybody feels about him, he was an absolute genius at marketing. He was a、oh. genius at propagating his art. He put so much work into karate spread in America. Like when he brought the art here, very few people knew what karate was. He、mm-hmm. he established the Long Beach、uh, tournaments. He got Bruce Lee on TV. He he worked with a lot of celebrities. He really worked hard to bring martial arts in general to the to the spotlight.、Mm-hmm. So I think that name attached to it is an attractor. And、I、see. Otherwise, people who try the art, it's, it's 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 a hit and miss. People who like the approach, it it feels good to do, and I think the whole scientific basis behind it. It's not a matter of just do this because I told you to. It's we're going to teach you this move because、right. this is the mechanic、right. you're doing. This is what it's teaching. This is why it's、mm-hmm. going to make it stronger, and this is what you're going to build on later. And、um, like okay, for example, this symbol. I don't know if you've seen this before. This is one of the core Kempo symbols. It's the universal、mm-hmm. patch. And the whole concept of that Ed Parker had was this represents every line and motion step path that a person can take, but this is only one plane of it. So if you imagine it flat, and you've got another one vertical, another one cross section this way to the point you have nine planes. That globe represents every single movement.、Mm. So I think a lot of people like that Kempo takes a scientific approach to it、mm-hmm. and I, I an academic approach, and it's. Sometimes overexplained, or it could be, or people perceive it that way. But there's no shortage of information. So there's,、mm. there's, and that's what I fell in love with. Just the whole, how deep the material goes. I can go back right now. I'm still going back to my white belt material I learned 28 years ago, and I'm still learning new things about it. Ah,、uh, right. That scientific aspect is very, very nice, and it's something we don't have here. So, you know, I, I think、uh, your founder started it. With a mindset to keep everything organized, so that's a very. I, I guess it's also because you know he looked at other martial arts, and it was him that he organized it, right? So、mm-hmm. I guess as a result, things the curriculum is I think a lot more、um, clear, and I think there are a lot more、um, books about kempo. As for Japanese karate, yeah, <laughs> done. <laughs> Here's a good introduction. Oh my God! <laughs> See, things like that aren't here in Japan. Everything, right? Nobody has、um, organized it. That's why people talk about I am under this sensei or this sensei、mm. because you have to actually be there and learn the technique, which is not efficient、Absolutely. at all. <laughs> But、uh, people fantasize that, and you know, people I guess love that that mysterious、um, side of I guess karate. Mm-hmm. And recently, it's the the katas are starting to、um, become more you know, organized, like a book. And because of the World Karate Federation, a lot of things are becoming standardized. So, you know, I guess that's a positive thing, as, as a, from a cultural aspect, to keep what was here. So, it was very it was very interesting to hear the differences of kempo, and.、Mm-hmm. We're now going to be moving on to the second、uh, video, so please, guys, check this video out.、Uh, the, t- the second video out as well. So yeah, that was it for the the first one. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.